Today's reading is 1 Samuel chapter 12. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and grey, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and also his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. (laughs) After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God. So he sold them into the hands of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We we have sinned. We have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jerob, Baal, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel. And he delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around you, so that you lived in safety. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, No, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands... And if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you, as it was against your ancestors. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call on the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called on the Lord, and that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain. So all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants, so that we will not die. For we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good. Nor can you res- they rescue you because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. 
and I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Great to see you all. Great to be here. Welcome if you're visiting. Welcome anyway. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. As we work our way through 1 Samuel, we pray that you would uh, take these ancient words and help us to apply them, to understand them and apply them uh, to our world today. Amen. So 1 Samuel chapter 12, many thanks to Jamie for working his way through it. Perhaps you feel uh, sometimes as we're doing 1 Samuel that you're traveling through uh, a foreign land. It seems uh, so different to us. Eli and his hopeless sons, uh, the ark and the Philistine battles are remote from our everyday experience here in the Cotswolds. And I'm so grateful to those who have preached so far, who have helped us to navigate uh, what is happening. I've learned a lot already, and it's been very helpful. And yet, even amidst the strange land, there are some familiar landmarks. Uh, We may not have lost our donkeys, as we heard about last week, but I'm absolutely sure that you've searched high and low for your glasses... Uh, or your car keys. Uh, What about Hannah? Surely her woes and her longing for a child and her prayers being answered resonate with some people's experience uh, today. Uh, I recalled as I prepared this sermon that at the 2012 Olympics where I was a chaplain in the Athletes' Village, I led a Bible study one day on Hannah, the, the first part of 1 Samuel. And it was attended by, amongst others, an Australian pistol shooter who had just competed, and I'm glad to say done very badly. (laughs) His his disappointment was multiplied by some very sad news from back home that his wife was very ill, and he was on his way to Heathrow uh, to fly home. And I've I've mentioned this story here before. We ended the Bible study praising God that Hannah's prayers were answered and her tears were turned to smiles. And this chap rushed off to the end, uh, but texted us from his taxi. He wrote, as we studied and prayed, my good Friday turned to Easter day. He had been very quiet in the Bible study, somewhat unusual for an Australian, I suppose, but he was, um, he actually, come to think of it, I I don't know why I say that, because the only Austrians I've ever met are either athletes or wine growers or politicians. Are there any other sorts of uh, Australians? (laughs) Uh, 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 Anyway, but he was a very quiet and uh, a lovely Christian Christian man. Uh, His Good Friday turned to Easter Day. What seemed to be bad turned out to be better than he thought. And that's a kind of repeating theme in 1 Samuel. Seeming disaster brought about by the foolishness or rebellion of the people, is turned around by God. Uh, They foolishly want a king, like the nations around them, but God uses the king initially to defeat their enemies. We shall see most memorably, of course, that even the threat of the giant Goliath in a chapter or two's time enables a better king than Saul to emerge, David. Samuel observes these comings and goings with a kind of patient trust that God will not abandon his chosen people even if they continue in their folly. That should be reassuring. He is under no illusions that there will be unhappy consequences for them if they go against God's will. One lesson we must all learn from this book is that sin, that is rebellion against God, is very serious and leads to all kinds of disasters. But as we shall see, sin, sin does not stop God doing his thing. I remember, and I mentioned this before, that wonderful program in the 60s called the Rowan and Martin Laugh-In, where they used to have a sort of celebrity guest come in and try and uh, set him up, and they got Billy Graham, the great evangelist, to come on. And they said to Billy Graham, what's wrong with the world? Expecting a sort of sermon which they could then mock. 
and he just said sin. It wasn't the funniest moment in the Rowan and Martin Luther, to be honest. Chapter 12, which we've got in front of us today, chapter 12 is Samuel's farewell message because he's handing over the leadership of Israel, uh, uh, the leadership of the nation, uh, to Saul. He's not altogether happy about it, as we know. Saul is a populist leader. His main qualification for leadership seems to be the rather slender one that he's taller than anyone else. Not, uh, not probably a thing that would win your vote, I trust, necessarily. Populist leaders in our time also uh, seem sometimes barely qualified, it seems to me. Just having bizarre blonde hair seems to be sufficient for some. <laughs> Samuel has agreed uh, to Saul becoming king, even though in chapter 8, you will recall, he's explained what kings get up to, what, what, what kings can get up to that they'll take the best of the population for their armies, that they'll take the best of the produce for themselves and their cronies, and they'll line their own pockets. They will pursue selfish ambition rather than the good of the nation. Uh, We see that in the world today. Perhaps uh, Putin is the nearest thing to what a bad Israeli king, Israel king, looked like in the Old Testament. But Samuel, in contrast, can rightly claim in the beginning of chapter 12 here that he has not been corrupt. He has not stolen or cheated anyone, he says, uh, and he's not accepted bribes. He's disappointed in his sons, who might naturally have moved into the priesthood, but he now points out that he is not handing power and authority to them. He says here, look, they're with you. They're just ordinary people in the peop- in the, in the, amongst the people. No privileges for his sons. So in contrast to other contemporary leaders, Samuel is a role model from whom we can all learn. It's of the utmost importance that those of us who profess Christian faith behave with honesty and integrity. It's crucially important. Nothing damages the church more or Christian reputation more than leaders who misbehave. And you'll have noticed how the media like to rub our noses in it when they do. So lesson one this morning from 1 Samuel 12, let's learn from Samuel's model of leadership and behave well. Pretty obvious lesson. One that Christians are not always very good at putting into practice. One that we find difficult, of course, but very important that we should aspire to. Very important that here in our local communities here, wherever we live, we are seen to be people who behave well with integrity. Lesson two is a warning. Uh, Look with me at verses uh, six and seven for a moment. Uh, Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I'm going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. Every time uh, one of us or any of us get up to preach, this is what we should be trying, this is what we should be trying to do. We are trying to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. That's what we do when we preach. We point to his creation, to his preservation, to his blessing, and of course his redemption of the world through Jesus Christ. There's very strong evidence, good reason, if you like, for believing the Bible. I was talking not so long ago to someone who who didn't know much about the Old Testament, but they dismissed it by saying the whole whole Old Testament is just made up. It's just a lot of made-up stories. And I refuted that. There's very strong evidence for believing it. Very strong evidence. But Samuel's speech contains a very firm warning. Verse 9. But they forgot the Lord their God, so he sold them into the hands of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They fell into the hands of their enemies. Despite their repeated deliverance, 
The people rebelled again by asking for a king, verse 12, even though the Lord your God was their king. Look at verse 15. Sin has consequences, serious consequences. If you do not obey the Lord your God, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Sin has consequences. What Samuel seems to be saying here, and I think it's a really important lesson and one that I kind of battled with as I prepared this sermon, what what is he really trying to say? He seems to be saying that if we do not live as God wants us to, he may allow us to get even more, into even more of a muddle in order that we might see the error of our ways. In other words, our sin might lead to greater trouble for us in order to wake us up, and God would allow that to happen. The choice of king initially did not seem too disastrous, even though, of course, Saul turned out to be useless in the end. But as we read on in 1 and 2 Kings, we find that king after king, both in Israel and later in Judah, were useless, and they led the people away astray, and eventually the country descended into civil war. Uh, that, that ended in the country becoming weaker and weaker and divided, and then the people were overwhelmed and taken into exile uh, in Assyria and in Babylon. Disaster. But eventually, the story of the Bible tells us that the true king comes, humble, riding on a donkey, not in a chariot, with unimpeachable integrity, Nobody could point to Jesus and find any sin in him. He could have spoken, as Samuel did. Unimpeachable integrity. He came, as the coronation service reminded us so powerfully, he came serving, not being served. But even then, as this king, Jesus, was being led to crucifixion, the people cried out to Pilate, Crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. What a terrible thing for the people of God, the Jewish people, to be shouting. That must be their lowest moment. They wanted a king. When the true king comes, they shout out, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar, the pagan tyrant. God's chosen nation had strayed far, far from his will. And God needed to bring them back. So let us heed God's warning and have no king but Jesus. No king in the sense of the Lord of our lives but Jesus. Be warned. Lesson three from this chapter is a challenge. Uh, So we have a model, a warning, and a challenge. In an agricultural economy, agrarian economy, it seems that God often manifests his power through nature. And here in verse 16, Samuel points to the action of the one who is really in control, the one who is running things. It's the wheat harvest. It's dry in the time of the wheat harvest so they can get the harvest in. But God proves himself to be in charge by bringing rain at an unexpected time. And the people are reminded, through the wrecking of the harvest, they're reminded of their dependence upon God. But Samuel has a word of encouragement even to to these pretty rebellious and hopeless people, people, to be honest, not so different after all from ourselves, despite the feeling that we're walking through a strange country. They are not so different to us. Read, let me read verses 20 to 22. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. That is intended for all of us today. Samuel says to them, it's never too late to turn back to the Lord. Never too late. You're never too old. 
or too far away from God to come back to him and start again. You're never, it's never too, too, never too late. And verse 23 is aimed at those of us with responsibility for leadership. As for me, far be it from me, says Samuel, that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. That's why we meet every Monday, a whole group of us here, so that we pray. God, forgive us if we forget to pray for our local community, for all of you, for so many things that we pray for on a Monday evening. Samuel says that is crucially important that we do that. And he says, he says it's crucial that we teach God's word and we'll do our best to teach the way that is good and right. We will do our best to do that. I'm sorry that when we get it wrong or if we're boring, I promise you that all of us who stand here will do our best to teach what is right. We'll do, we'll do our best to teach what is right. And may God judge mercifully those ministers of the gospel who behave badly and teach lies. May God have mercy on them because it's very important. Ultimately, each one of us, as Samuel makes so clear here, is responsible for how we live and, uh, and what we do with the evidence that God lays before us. It's down to you, it's down to me, what we do with that evidence. So if you want a role model, then you've got Samuel, a man of great integrity. If you are complacent or rebellious or unbelieving, or backsliding, be warned, be warned. And if you are ready, fear the Lord and serve him faithfully. Amen.
us pray. In the power of the Spirit and in union with the risen and ascended Christ, let us pray to the Father. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful sunny morning when we could come together as your people to join in our praises, in our worship, and to hear what you have to say for us. We thank you for this beautiful world and this part of God's world that we have been placed and privileged to see the beauty of your creation. How very true it is, as the hymn writer writes, something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. And Master, we know that quite often we have abused your beautiful creation, marred your image in us through our pride, our greed, and our selfish motives. We pray for the world, Lord, around us, whom we see in so much of despair, in turmoil, when there is so much of confusion and no hope. Lord, we pray for the world leaders, especially our own Prime Minister and our King, that they would be governed and directed by your Spirit in leading and doing what is best for this nation and for the good of all people. Lord, we pray for the situation in the world, especially in Ukraine and in other parts of the world where there is drought, homelessness, and Lord, we also remember the persecuted church, your body, Lord, that has been persecuted. Lord, we pray for those, especially in North Korea, in China, and in the Arab world, and also, Lord, in Africa, where people are facing so much of distress, discrimination, and turmoil. Even in our own nation, Lord, Many Christians faring, facing persecution in subtle manners. Lord, in all these times, Lord, help them not to lose their hope and their trust in you. Give them that strength to continue to persevere, holding on to the promises that you would never leave them nor forsake them. And Father, Please be merciful to the persecutors, Lord. Let them also learn of your love. Your death on the cross on their behalf to restore them to where they should belong. And Lord, we pray for all those organizations that are working for Open Doors, the Voices of Martyrs, and various other organizations helping those who are in need for peace for those among us who lead these organizations and hold responsible positions, we pray for wisdom and understanding that they would do what is right and what is best according to your plans and purposes for these people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, Lord, the Bride of Christ. Oh, what a wonderful privilege we have, Lord, because of the death of your Son on the cross to restore us into that wonderful relationship that we enjoy. Something that was designed in the first place. We pray for the church, Lord, and for all the challenges and issues and problems that we have because of our interpretation of the Word of God. Lord, as Andrew remind us, help us, Lord, to preach the word truthfully, courageously, and boldly. And yes, Master, we pray for all those who are leading and teaching, even those in authority in the heads of churches, not only in the Anglican Church, but the Church Universal, Lord, that needs to teach your word with sincerity, with honesty, and with a clear conviction that would move the hearts of men and women to acknowledge you, just as they did when Ezra read the word of God openly to all the people of Israel. 
Lord, convict us and change us that we would be useful ministers for your glory. Lord, we pray also for those even teaching in schools, in the youth ministries, and especially, Lord, for the Sunday school where children have not fully grasped what the truth is with so much of distractions and deceptions around them. Lord, we also thank you for Tom and for Andrew and Gerald and for Martin and for all those who lead and teach and for the prayer ministry, for the PCC, for those taking care of the church, for those providing refreshments at the end of every service. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us and we praise your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, we remember those who are sick and those who are in need among us. Those who are sick in mind, body, or soul. Those who are facing various challenges with the threats of the high cost of living, job threats and job losses, for ill health, for those waiting for medical treatment, for those recovering from surgeries. And Master, with all that is happening around us, we seek your divine guidance in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be laboring farmers, disciplined athletes, and sacrificial soldiers, as Paul has reminded us, to hold on to the truth that you have given us in your word and that we know, let it be applied into our lives through our hearts. And yes, Master, we want you to be part of our lives as you have promised that you will abide in us. And as you abide in us, let us live lives that will truly show forth your life and your life and your love in our lives, that others may see who Jesus really is. Spirit of God descending, fill our hearts with heavenly joy. Love with every passion blending, pleasure that can never cloy. Thus provided, pardoned, guided, nothing can our peace destroy. Yes, Lord, with you living with us and living in us, Nothing can destroy the peace that we have in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Find them the power and the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. I'd just like to read um, something that I received on the 28th of June, Sunday the 28th of June 2020, and I woke up to this email. We just wanted to let you know how much we're enjoying your Swinbrook at 11. You remember that, the, the videos we sent out every week. The, we just wanted to let you know how much we are enjoying your Swinbrook at 11, even though we're down south in Aus South Australia. We listen to you each week. Nigel Street gave us the link to you. We have family living not far from you in Mindy, so when and if we are ever allowed to travel again, we will indeed come to visit Swinbrook and look forward to meeting you face to face. Keep up the great work with God's blessings. Vanessa and David blows, and they kept that promise, and they're here today. So let come forward, David. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good day. <Good> <laughs> Well, it's lovely having you here. You're here you're, you've been here for, so, for how long so far? Um, about two weeks. You, you hold that up, right, yeah. Yeah, about two weeks. Two weeks, and you've got another two weeks here or another week or so here, yes. is that right? Right. Yes. 
and you have family here. I have a brother who lives in Mindy, a sister who lives in Dorset, and another brother in Chichester. Right, so you're doing, doing the rounds. Doing the rounds. And I think you met David in England, didn't you? I did. What were you doing, David, then? Um, in those days, I was over here working with uh, ICI, which, of course, no longer exists no. Um, in agriculture. Right. And uh, I'd been over working in... Uh, Central America, in Costa Rica, right. um, came back on furlough and met Vanessa. And uh, that's 47 years ago. Right. And the rest is history, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah lovely. And obviously you went back, went back to Australia. And tell me what, about what you do in Australia. Now, um, when we went back to Australia, we've always farmed. Um, and in the last 20 years, we've been growing grapes uh, for the production of wine. Um, and um, we... Provide. We sell about 750 tonnes a year to a number of different outlets. Some of those outlets uh, or labels are here in uh, the UK. Some are more localised in the national market, yes. Right. And we do that in conjunction with our two sons, um, Benjamin and Hugo, and they're holding the fort at the moment um, as Vintage has just finished a week or so right. ago. Um, so, so far, so good. And you're in South Australia, aren't you? Is that We're right? in the Adelaide Hills, yeah. which is about yeah. an hour to run to the um, east from Adelaide itself and at about 1,250 feet above sea level. Right. Mm. And, you, and uh, you, you belong to a church in Adelaide itself, is that right? Or no, is that just outside? no. We belong to a church at a town called Orgate, um, or a village, really, um, which is about half an hour's run for us from our home in Macclesfield, all these English names, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Holy Trinity there is uh, our church. Um, we have a congregation normally of about 150 people, okay. um, and uh, that church is part of a, uh, a network, of yeah. Church of England, yeah. uh, the Trinity Network, uh, and their major objective is to plant churches Right. Uh, and so far, in the 20 years that we've been associated with them, they've planted 15 new churches wow. yeah, in and around Adelaide and in the hills. That's so it. God has blessed us. So, so that, that ch so Holy Trinity is the hub for all these other churches? Absolutely, yeah. for and, a and network. It, and is it part of that network? Are they sort of rather like we have Holy Trinity Brompton that's a network here? Yes, exactly. That same sort yes, of thing that's there? right, yeah. But with this set objective of planting new churches, yeah. and uh, they've been, you know, God has blessed us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in many, many ways. To, uh, and all those churches that they're blessed generally start off with a population of about 25 or 30, some people migrating from one church to support them when they start. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and now most of those churches have that sort of congregation, in yeah. some cases even more. Right, that's mm. very encouraging. Mm. And um, obviously, you, have you been, both of you been Christians for as long as you remember, or was there a moment when you, you came to faith or um, made think, a decision? Yeah. Vanessa and I have both been um, uh, committed Christians for the last 40 years. Mm. Um, uh, wherever we've moved uh, in that time since we moved back from the UK, um, we've always looked for a church family that suited us. Mm. Um, our church is probably you would describe as evangelical, yeah. uh, but a very active program for young people. Uh, we have mm. two or three Sunday school groups, mm -hmm. and then um, a lot of uh, activities for ch teenagers and yeah. younger people, yeah. Okay. So very, very active, yeah. Wow. Mm. And um, tell me about your, I mean, it sounds like you've got a very rich and, uh, and enduring faith, but where is it particularly helpful to you as a, as a wine producer and all the rest of it and that kind of yeah, thing, yeah. and family and living yeah. in Australia and all the rest of it, and, and, yeah. and going to lose the, obviously lose the test series, that's going to be a problem for you. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you would need prayer for that, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm more worried about the rugby. <laughs> um, um, well, I look, I mean, I always think, I always say to people, it's very easy to be a committed Christian and to be thankful when you're a farmer, because every day you go out there, you see God's hand at work in nature, um, you see the blessing of great harvest, uh, an ability to, to you know, overcome problems, um, and as you probably know, we lost our eldest son, Oliver, four years ago, and um, uh, it's been great to, to know that one day we'll be with him again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, it's, uh, anything you want to add to that? And you, no, your husband's done all the talking. Yeah, he's very, yeah, good, at he's very good at that, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> when, well, I get, when I get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, let, 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 let me pray for you both. Thank I you. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for David and for Vanessa for bringing them over here. I like the way that Vanessa said, I want to meet our second family when she comes here this morning. And it's so nice that you've been um, watching, uh, listening to the Thought for the Week uh, and the, the regular recordings of our services and, and linking with us here like that. We ask your blessing on them, on their, their marriage, on their family, on their business and on their church and pour out your, your spirit upon them and your peace and your strength and your hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank, you, Thank you very much.